You like tomato, and I like tomato. And you Viennese, you like paradise, or don't you? <laughs> yes, we all love tomatoes. We only use different words. And some say it's a fruit. Others, like me, would say it's a vegetable. Well, if these were the only problems in tomato world, this would be a wonderful world. <laughs> tomato is the most consumed vegetable. It's very healthy, although you have to eat many kilos a day for this health effect. <laughs> yes, you can even have a diet with tomatoes. <laughs> but be careful, they contain lots of sugar. We want our food to be sweeter and sweeter. Like these dulce, dulce, sweet, sweet tomatoes, it's written there, I photographed on a Romanian local market. I'm not a professional photographer. But you see something else on this picture. There is no one around to buy these nice local Romanian tomatoes. On Romanian local markets and also in the supermarkets and even in summer, you can buy many more imported tomatoes than Romanian ones and mostly they are even cheaper. Like these very clever tomatoes who traveled all the way to Romania to find the first row place, Maybe you can see it says they are from Hollanda, from Holland. Well, on the package it says they are from Spain. <laughs> For the taste, it will have no difference. <laughs> Why are unlimited streams of tomatoes crossing the European continent? And why are similar tomatoes crossing each other? from the northern to the south, and from the western to the east. <laughs> they may even meet somewhere in the middle of the continent, like here in Vienna. Hey, hello brother. <laughs> you do look just like me. Are we closely related? Sure. So where are you going to? Well, I'm on my way to the Netherlands. Hey, that's funny, that's where I'm just coming from. <laughs> just like me, I come from Amsterdam, but living for many years now in, uh, in Berlin. And uh, I followed the tomato all over the European continent. But I cannot travel as fast as the tomato does. It's real fast food. <laughs> and what I'm doing is slow journalism. Since three years now, I'm researching on a book. It will be titled Biography of the Tomato. <laughs> it will be published next year. Sorry, only in Dutch language, but Maybe I will find an international publisher as well. I follow the tomato from its birth to its death when it's eaten. So from the seat to the supermarket. And today I want to share with you my experiences. I want to think with you about food chain madness. Actually, the tomato is only a symbol for this. My project, it started with a bell pepper. Some of you might know, I think here in Vienna all do, that Hungary is the bell pepper country. Paprika country. So I was very shocked to find in the Hungarian supermarkets more paprikas, more bell peppers from Holland as from Hungary itself. Who decide this? Well, the multinational supermarkets do. In Hungary, the bell pepper is seasonal, and its quality it depends on the weather. 
and other factors. But the supermarket chains, they want a supply of constant quality of the same bell peppers in huge amounts all year through. So they prefer to make deals with huge trade organization of growers from Spain, from the Netherlands, from other countries. And how can the growers give them this constant amount? Well, first by mass production, secondly by re-export. Re-export is to import first in order to export again. Maybe you know these traffic light packages of three bell peppers. Well, the green one may come from Israel, the yellow or orange one from Spain, and the red one from the Netherlands, and there they are all packed together to be exported again. And this is exactly why bell peppers, like tomatoes, cross the European continent from the north to the south, from the western to the east, and not so much the other way round. Like in the United States, for instance, where the tomato is a field vegetable and is transported from the warmer south to the colder north. What I'm showing you it's the battle of Europe with fresh vegetables. It's also the battle of Brussels, European Union capital, where big trade organizations successfully lobby for huge subsidies. We made a Dutch television production about this to see how to show how the free market works. And this is how it starts. In the first shot, you saw my colleague Roland in a typical Dutch bell pepper house. It could have been about here in Glass City in the Netherlands. By the way, do you know Holland, the Netherlands? It's so tiny, you hardly could find it on the map. There, the orange spot. But the Netherlands are export country number world. Uh, number one of the world in fresh, fresh vegetables. How is that possible? <laughs> These glass houses, they produce eight or ten times more even than uh, Spanish uh, greenhouses, which are mostly foil, plastic ones. So, glass houses are effective. They don't need, mu need much land, but they need lots of energy. Big growers have their own power stations. Some even recycle their energy, which is, of course, a good thing. So these super-controlled glass houses, they are the secret of an almost years-round mass production, here again with tomatoes. There are also experiments with artificial, artificial light. Uh, important is that the state and the science world and European Union support these technological innovations in the Netherlands, not so much in, for instance, Hungary. Here you see a typical foil greenhouse in Hungary after bad spring weather, this was. I visited a young, very ambitious grower of bell peppers uh, in Hungary. And this is his 
wood burner and in spring to stretch the season a little, he had to get up every night four times to feed this wood burner. He's all alone in Hungary, quite differently from the Netherlands. Growers mistrust each other. That's an heritage of communism. So they are not united. Here's the, the wood burner again. They have no money to invest. And these are conditions to, 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 to get these European Union subsidies. So they cannot compete. It's not their fault. It's the free market which works against them. Here we have Spain, typical Spain greenhouse landscape from a bird's perspective. You might say it's more natural to grow tomatoes in these unheated foil greenhouses. Yes, but where is nature here? Spain again, how about water? To grow tomatoes, you need much water. Spain has already a water problem. Let me make one thing clear to you at this point. I'm not promoting any way of uh, production. And I'm not judging anyone. I'm a journalist, I'm describing, I'm asking questions, and I want you to think with me about this. I actually met very passionate, nice growers all over Europe, open-minded, they are, they are no mafia. <laughs> Actually, the growers are not the big winners of the system. Even the Dutch one with their super glass houses are not. It's the supermarkets that dictate them very low prices for which they have to produce more and more to get the same most small profit. This story is about trade. It's about money. Here is the big, one of the biggest of the world, trade fairs. It's in Berlin, where I live. The question is here, how can we make the Germans eat even more tomatoes than they already do? Maybe by this huge promotion campaigns granted by European Union. Yes, this is the same fair, a tomato and a pear. The pear is there. <laughs> what I'm showing you, it's not a European process. It's a worldwide process. Take this pear or an apple. It's autumn now here. So seasonal fruit, pears and apples, they are ripe. But in my Amsterdam and my Berlin supermarkets, three quarters of the apples and pears come from South Africa, Argentina, New Zealand. Well, it's spring there, this, these must be very old apples. <laughs> we are together in Vienna now. I had the privilege to do here this year research on the topic. And what a great feedback I got from you, Viennese. Some of you said to me, Annemieke, we only eat local tomatoes. Think global, act local. Most of you would agree. And then you are thinking of some natural grown tomato, freeland open air tomato, freiland tomate. Yes, well, this was a very sympathetic effort. Uh, the people who organized this spot had to struggle for it years with the authorities of Vienna to get this spot between the garbage containers. <laughs> and they will be very, they enjoy to eat their 50 tomatoes of it, not bothering about the gases of the cars driving along. Of course, this was only an extreme example. But can Freeland tomatoes satisfy the Austrian need of tomatoes? And are they so natural? No way. Okay, Austria is situated a little bit more east and more south than the Netherlands. But how do you think most local Austrian tomatoes grow? In glasshouses, heated glasshouses, and in summer even 
cooled glass houses. A Viennese environmental scientist, she explained to me that um, there is more environmental damage, for instance, CO2 emissions, to eat these local Viennese tomatoes than eating Spanish unheated tomatoes, even if they are transported all the way to Vienna by truck. <laughs> by the way, transport. You Austrians also love to eat pure organic tomatoes, but did you ever ask yourself where they come from? Most of them are imported from far away, even from outside Europe. So, think global, act local. It's a nice yell, but it's not a solution here. I want to challenge you to think with me about this. Many people think organic tomatoes are field tomatoes. I've thought that myself a few years ago. But do you realize how many natural enemies these field tomatoes have from the air, from the earth? To grow tomatoes on the field, in the field commercially, you have to kill all those enemies. This is exactly what happens in the United States of America on these fields. This is huge chemical business. Glasshouse tomatoes, on the other hand, where there is no earth, a very controlled setting, closed, you can all do almost without chemicals. There are bees flying around. There are wasps flying around, killing the enemies of the tomato. If you would use insecticides, you would also kill these good animals. <laughs> Isn't this an amazing paradox? If you want your tomato to be natural, almost organic, uh, good looking, um, in huge amount, all year through, they have to come from glass houses. Of course, nothing is natural about eating tomatoes from glass houses, but nothing is natural about eating tomatoes in Europe. They once came from America, but who cares? Yeah, and here you, you might have thought, what is this picture? Well, this is my Berlin balcony. <laughs> I'm growing my Hungarian peppers. It looks nice, doesn't it? But what the hell does this have to do with nature? This is real nature. You see here Erich Stekovic on his organic field, uh, field with organic tomatoes. A storm just blew over his field. But Erich said, well, no problem, they will survive. But field tomatoes, well, they are not good looking. He has not much yield. What he does is making nice vinegars and marmalades from it. His purpose is quite another one. He's a former religion teacher who wants to educate people. He has actually a glass house, and there he grows very wonderful old traditional heirloom tomatoes and invites the many visitors he gets to Taste them. There are many Europeans like Erich Stekovic. They try to save these old heirloom tomatoes because these are in danger because of the rules of the free market and also the new registration rules of the European Union. So, we have masses of tomatoes in Europe. What do we do with it? We can't eat them all. We organize Tomato festivals where you can throw tomatoes at each other. You get drunk, then you throw tomatoes. And this shadow, that's me. I fled into some shelter house for the expected victims. So I won't throw any tomatoes to you. That would be no solution. Thank you. Oh. <laughs>